This passage that we read is towards the end of the life of Jacob. And oftentimes, uh, at that deathbed scene, towards the end of their days, the family would gather, as they would today, and that patriarch, that leader of that family, would give blessings. He would give last words. He would give encouragement to the different family members. That's exactly what's happening here as Jacob is towards the end of his life. The Bible says his eyes are growing dim. He's not going to be on this earth much longer. And Joseph, who have now been gone from Jacob for quite some time and has had children, and he says, I want my dad to see my boys, and I want him to bless them. And he brings his two sons before his daddy, and he asks of him that he would bless them. And he calls the two boys in, and he strategically places them in the right place. Uh, give me Timothy and, uh, and uh, Thomas off the front row. Come up here, if you would, please. And so he brings his two boys before, and he has them kneel down. And he, on purpose, puts the older one towards the dad's right hand, and he puts the younger one towards the dad's left hand. So that as he places his hands on these boys to give the blessing, the older one will receive the right hand blessing. What is the right hand blessing? It was that uh, promise of birthright. It was that person that got the special blessing. Actually, it tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 21, they received a double portion of the inheritance. And so whatever it was that dad had to distribute out, it would be evenly divided. But the older child, the firstborn, would receive a double portion of what everybody else received. It was a place of honor. God even commanded that the firstborn would be set apart, sanctified unto him in every family. And because Jacob's eyes were growing dim and because he could not see very well, uh, Joseph wanted to make sure they were in the right position. So the Bible says, here's Joseph behind him. He took the younger on his right hand, and he placed it before Jacob's left hand. And he took the older, which was on his left hand, and he placed it in front of dad towards his right hand. And that way, the proper blessing would be given to each. Very interesting, as Jacob gets ready to give the blessing, as Jacob gets ready to pronounce this extra portion upon the older and this extra blessing that would come his way, the Bible says that as Jacob stretched forth his hands, he crossed them. And he put his right hand, you're too tall, he put his <laughs> right hand on the younger son and he put his left hand on the older son. Uh, Joseph got a little perturbed by it. He said, no, 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 dad, 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 I I've got them lined up for you, just perfect. Just stick your hands out and give the blessing. I've got them on purpose ready to receive that right hand blessing because he's the oldest. And dad didn't cross, uncross his hands. He said, I know it, my son. I know it. And to this one, the younger, he gave the blessing that was supposed to go to the older. And to the older, he gave the blessing that was supposed to go to the younger. It was just not a crossing of the hands that took place that day, but an exchanging of that which belonged to him was placed upon him. And that which belonged to him was placed upon him. Joseph saw it as a problem, but God knew it was a picture. Because many years later, God the Father was going to do the exact same thing. I want to talk to you this morning about this thought. When God crossed his hands. Go to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. Another picture is given here. The Bible says, beginning at verse 20, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron, that's the high priest, shall lay his hands upon the head of the live goat, 
and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. You see, God knew that there needed to be something that had to bear the sins of the people. So that goat was representative of the one that would bear the sin. Now we know that there would be a lamb that would be sacrificed on the day of atonement and the shedding of that blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But God wanted there to be an outward picture, an understanding about what was going to take place with that sin. Not only it would be cleansed and washed by the blood of the lamb, but also that sin of the people would be placed on something else and sent away into the wilderness. One day, God looked down from heaven and he saw me and he saw you in our sins. The Bible said we were dead in trespasses and sins. His justice demanded a payment for our sin. That payment meant that something had to die. Blood had to be shed. There had to be an atonement that was placed and he sent his son Jesus and Jesus not only became the sacrifice on that cross, but he also became that one who took what belonged to us and had it placed upon him. Just like that goat had the sins of the people, that goat had not done anything wrong. That goat was just a picture. It was just a symbol that all of these sins and all of these iniquities would be placed upon that goat. And the Bible says of Jesus, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him, and by and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and listen, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. God took that which belonged to you and me and placed it upon his son. A man's drunkenness and abuse was placed on Christ. Man's pride and jealousy he laid on Christ. Man's bitterness and hatred he laid on Christ. Man's fornication and adultery he laid on Christ. Man's mocking and cursing he laid on Christ. Man's wicked thoughts and immoral deeds were laid on Christ. Envy and strife were laid on Christ. Idolatry and witchcraft were laid on Christ. All of man's anger and malice was laid on Christ. Man's robbery and man's uh, deceit were laid on Christ. His gambling and his cheating, man's complaining and criticism, his apathy and his arrogance, his selfishness and his self-centeredness, his agnosticism and his atheism, all that that belonged to you and me, God the Father took it off of us and laid it upon him. He has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Every sin and every transgression he laid on him. Sins of the mind and sins of the mouth were laid on him. Sins of the hands and sins of the heart were laid on him. Sins of the eyes and sins of the ears were laid on him. Sins from within and sins from without were laid on him. Every sin of every man, every sin of every woman, every sin of every boy, every sin of every girl, every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed on Calvary's cross, God the Father took all of that off of you and off of me and placed it on his son. God took my sin and your sin and all of our sin and he crossed his hands and placed that which belonged to us upon Jesus Christ. All oh, but wait. Then God took his other hand, the one that belonged to what belonged to Christ. And not only did he take off of us 
what was ours and place it upon his son. But he took off of his son what was his and he placed it upon us. God traded my sin for Christ's salvation. Be it known unto you all and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which is a set at naught of you for the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Hey, the salvation that is found in Christ and Christ alone was placed upon me when I by faith trusted him. All of my sins were placed upon Christ and all that Christ had in salvation was placed upon me the day that God crossed his hands. Oh, I greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in God for he hath clothed me with the garments of his salvation. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You see, that day the firstborn did not deserve to have it taken from him and given to the younger. Nor did the younger have what was his be deserved to be taken by the firstborn. But he, knowing, he moving his hands wittingly on purpose, it was not a mistake that day, it was not an error that day, it was not an oversight, it was not just because he was an old man, it was not just because he could not see clearly, on purpose he said, I'm going to choose to take that which belongs to you and give it to you and take that which belongs to you and give it to you and God crossed his hands on Calvary's tree and you and I got what belonged to Christ made a manifest on you and Christ took what belonged to me and had it placed upon his own back hallelujah for the day God crossed his hands August 27 1976 on a Friday night God reached down from heaven and took the sins of Jack Bachman and placed them upon Jesus Christ and he took the salvation that can be found in none other but his son and he placed it upon Jack Bachman oh it was not a mistake it was not an error. I didn't deserve it, but he wittingly, he knowingly, he on purpose chose to give me what belonged to Christ and take what was mine and put it upon his son. Go to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. We see another trade that God made when he crossed his hands. It says in chapter 64 and verse 6 of the book of Isaiah, But we are all an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. My righteousness, your righteousness, my good works, your good works, my attempts of doing right and your attempts of doing right, the whole sum value of all of my holiness, all added up together, comes to a grand total of filthy rags. The very best that I can do, the very best day that I have, the very best week of me trying to do all that I can to please God. He says, Jack, all that you can offer me, all that you can give me, all that you can muster in your own flesh is like filthy rags in my sight. That's all that you have. 
Like Paul, I would have to say, I know me, that in me dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And you'd have to admit you've been there before, that you wanted to do right, and you tried to do right, and even though sometimes you did do right, really, compared to the holiness of God, you didn't have much to offer. Aren't you glad this morning we're not going to heaven based on our own merit? Aren't you glad that God made a way that you didn't have to earn your way in? That you didn't have to have enough value within yourself, enough holiness within yourself to be able to get to heaven on your own accord? Hey, all that I've got is nothing but rags in God's sight. So God crossed his hands and he took all of my efforts and he took all my attempts and he took all my endeavors of righteousness that I had and he placed that on his son. Oh, but hold on. Buckle up. Because then God took all that was on his son, all the righteousness that belonged to him, all the perfection that he identified with and all of the goodness that is found in him and all of the holiness and all of the merit and God said, I'm going to choose to take that which is yours, your filthy rags and place that upon my son. But then I'm going to choose to take that which belongs to him and I'm going to place his righteousness on you, dear friend. Oh, it was a great day when God crossed his hands and traded my rags for his robe. Romans 3 and 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, listen, and upon all that believe. When God looks at Jack Botman, he no longer sees my righteousness because that was placed upon Christ. But what he does see is the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to my account. I could not merit heaven on my own. You could never merit heaven on your own righteousness. There is only one righteous record that could allow us to come into the very presence of God. And that is the record, the righteousness, yea, the robe of righteousness that was draped in the divinity of Jesus Christ himself. God said one day, he said, hey, I want you to take off that robe of righteousness that you've worn for all of eternity past, and I choose to today place it upon that boy that doesn't deserve it, that doesn't merit it, but I'm going to make a trade, and I'm going to take your righteousness, which is nothing but rags and give it to Jesus Christ and I'm going to take your righteousness which is perfect and holy and has no fault and has no error and I will place it upon every person that trusts Jesus as his Savior. What a trade. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath covered me with the robe of his righteousness oh what a great day when God crossed his hands where did I get my robe of righteousness it wasn't in my closet where did I get my robe of righteousness it wasn't in my good deeds where did I get my robes of righteousness Hey, I could not afford such a robe and you could not purchase such a robe because it's a price that is beyond what any of us could pay but by the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God, one day God crossed his hands and he took your rags and gave it to his son and he took that robe of righteousness and draped it over your shoulders. Hey, I'm going to heaven because I've got Christ's righteousness applied to my account. My merit is not my own. It is the merit of Jesus Christ. My worthiness is not my own. It is the worthiness of Jesus Christ. 
My value is not my own. It is the value of Jesus Christ. I have no perfection in myself, but I now have the perfection of Jesus Christ. Hey, I have no holiness of my own to offer, but now I have the holiness of Jesus Christ. I have no righteousness of my own, but the robe of righteousness I wear and the robe of righteousness you wear as a child of God was because one day God willingly, God knowingly, God on purpose crossed his hand and took your rags and gave them to Christ and took his robe and gave them to you. What a good trade that was. I have his perfect love applied to my account. I have his perfect joy applied to my account. I have his perfect words and his perfect deeds and his perfect thoughts all applied to my account. I've got his perfect feelings and his perfect emotions and his perfect motives and his perfect attitude and his perfect treatment of others and his perfect victory over sin and his perfect record applied to my account. The righteousness of Christ himself is draped on our shoulders as children of God because one day God crossed his hands. Listen to what it says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. God took my feeble attempts of righteousness that fall far short of anything that would muster any kind of merit for heaven. And he took the perfect, holy, complete righteousness of Christ and placed it upon me. Hey, we'll stand before God justified. We'll stand before God holy. We'll stand before God worthy, not because of our own righteousness, but because Christ's righteousness has been applied to our account. Some may say like Joseph, no God, you have it wrong. It is the one on your right hand that deserves the perfect record. I have nothing I can offer. I have no good of my own account. God, you've got it messed up. You made a mistake. But just like Jacob, God says, no, I know, son. I know what I'm doing. And I have chosen, because of the love that I have for you, to take that which belongs to you and put it upon my son, but also to take that which is my son's and place it upon you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the day God crossed his hands. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. There's yet another trade God would like to make with you this morning. In 1 Peter in chapter 5, familiar verse number 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God says, I want you to come with your burdens. I want you to come with your troubles. I want you to come with your struggles. I want you to come with your difficulties. I want you to bring me all of your stresses. I want all of your anxieties, all of your fear, all of your uncertainties, all of your worries and all of your hardships and all of your heaviness. All of your problems, cast them on Christ. They don't belong to him. And can I tell you that many of the things that I bear in this life are of my own doing. I know that life is life and life brings hardship and life brings difficulties. But dear friend, most of the time when we're suffering, we probably could have avoided it. But all of those troubles and all of those struggles and all of those problems that I often face, they really are mine. They've got my name on them. They belong to me and are often a result of my own fault. And God said, I want to make you a trade. I want to take all of that which belongs to you all of your cares and I want to cast them on him and
And then, I'm going to take that which is his. And in exchange, I'm going to place it upon you. Peace I give unto you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. What a deal. What a swap. What a great trade. God is willing this morning to take all of your anxieties and all of your cares and all of your struggles and all of your burdens and all of your problems and place them on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And then he said, I'll cross my hands and that which is upon him, perfect peace and wonderful peace and peace that passeth all understanding, I'll give it to you. What a deal. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, dear friend, I can promise you this morning, whatever burdens you carry, Jesus can handle them better than you can. Whatever problems you're facing this morning is no problem for the Son of God. And every struggle that you go through and every trial that you endure and every burden that you bear and every obstacle that you got to climb over, for you, it's all you can do to breathe. It's all you can do to walk. It's all you can do to go another day. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, hey, come over here. Let me take that upon myself. I can bear that for you. And in exchange, I'll give you my burden. It's a light burden. It's an easy burden. What a trade when God crosses his hands in my life and yours. Oh, there's great peace available in exchange for your problems if you'll just let God cross his hands. Whatever you're carrying this morning, let God cross his hands. Whatever you're bearing this morning, let God cross his hands. Whatever you're holding on to this morning, let God cross his hands. Whatever you're dragging around, let God. God crosses hands. Whatever you're worried about this morning, whatever you're concerned about this morning, whatever you're struggling with this morning, whatever you're weighed down with this morning, whatever you're staggering under the load of this morning, hey, let God cross his hands. Surely he hath borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. Hey, God is willing to make a swap with you and take your problems and put them on his son in an exchange put his son's peace in your heart. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ shall rest upon me. Did you hear that? Amen. Brother Bachman, I don't think I got the power to get through it. You're right, you don't. But if you let God cross his hands, you can now have his power. Brother Bob, I don't think I have the peace to endure. You're right. That peace that the world gives is temporal. That peace that the world gives only lasts a certain amount of time. That peace that the world gives is usually just a distraction but doesn't change the problem. But I've got a God that knows how to change problems and he'll take the problems that belong to you and place them upon the problem solver and he'll take the peace and the power that's only found in Jesus Christ and he'll place it upon you and you'll find out you can make it and endure if you let his power rest upon you. My, what a trade. Unfortunately, often, like Joseph, I don't think in a wrong way, but we say, no, 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 God, just leave it like I've got it. This fits into my plan. This is how I want it to happen. 
And in our own stupidity, in our own ignorance, we don't allow God to cross his hands. Instead of saying, I want his power and his peace placed upon me, we continue to try to bear our own burden. And hence we fall beneath the load. We try to work out our own solution and therefore we live very frustrated. We try to say, I think I can do it. No, sir, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We have got to be smart enough and we have got to be humble enough and we've got to come to God and say, I don't have the answer and I cannot make it by myself and I don't know what to do and I cannot bear this load. But God, if you would please just cross your hands and take what belongs to me and place it upon your son and take what belongs to your son and place it upon me, I'd be willing to let you do it this morning. Oh, what joy will come. What peace will come? What power will come when you let God cross his hands and trade your problems for Christ's peace? Be careful, full of care, worried, overly concerned about nothing. But by everything, with prayer and supplication, let your request, let your burden, let your trouble, let your difficulty be made known unto God and the peace of God that passeth all understanding will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. You see, God does have a lot better plan than mine. He does have a lot better plan than yours. And when we're tempted to say, God, it's not fair. And God, I don't think I can make it. And God, I'm struggling beneath the load. And I can't go another day. That is not God's fault. That is because you won't let God cross his hands in your life and you think that your plan and the way you've got it all lined up is somehow better than an omnipotent, wonderful God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ask or think. But you've got to be willing, like Joseph was, when you complain to God and say you got it all wrong, to hear his voice. I know, my son, I know. And on purpose, out of grace, and out of mercy, and out of kindness, and out of love, I have chosen to cross my hands in your life, if you'll just let me. Wouldn't it be great this morning if someone that's here that does not know Christ as their Savior. You have tried. You have worked. You have given effort to do all you can to somehow merit heaven if you would quit trying to do it your way and let God cross his hands in your life and take your sin and let him paste that upon Jesus Christ and take Christ's salvation and this morning, let him place that upon you. Wouldn't it be good this morning if you would allow your rags of righteousness to be exchanged for his robe of righteousness? And wouldn't it be good that this week, as you and I both face problems and struggles and hardship, that we would not try to do it in our own power, but we would say, God, this is more than I can bear. And so I'm going to cast all my care upon you. And I'm going to allow you to take your peace and your power and let it rest upon me. God has not changed his mind since Genesis 43. God has not changed his mind since Calvary's Hill. He is still in the hand-crossing business. 
And this morning, he wants to give you something you don't deserve. You're not in line for, but by the grace of God. Heavenly Father, I pray, please, 